Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 61. It's about World War I then. What was happening a hundred years ago this week? And it's about World War I now. News and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. Today is March 2nd, 2018, and our guests for this week include Dr. Edward Lengel, joining Catherine Akey and I in a March preview roundtable. Mike Schuster from the Great War Project blog with an update on the fallout from the Russian defeat on the Eastern Front. Charles Van Way, George Thompson, and Sanders Marble on medicine in World War I and their new website on the Commission server. Dr. Marjorie DeRozier on the struggle of African-American nurses in World War I. Gordon Aylshire telling us about the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project in Raymond, Washington. Eliza Chin, Carrie Kukrell, and Molly Marr telling us about the short documentary At Home and Over There, American Women Physicians in World War I. Catherine Akey with a special report on an amazing French World War I photography curator. It's a great lineup today on World War I Centennial News, a weekly podcast brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission, and your host. Welcome to the show. Last month, we did an experiment. Dr. Edward Lengel, Catherine, and I sat down, as we often do in our editorial meetings, and talked about the upcoming month of February. We got great feedback from you, so we're going to do it again here at the top of March. I put a sidecar on our centennial time machine so we'd all fit as we roll back 100 years to the war that changed the world. So guys, I understand this is our last chance to take a breather. Starting this month, the action gets pretty hot and heavy with the Germans getting ready for their big spring offensive. Catherine, you use the term Kaiserschlacht or Emperor's Strike. Is that the same thing as the spring offensive? Yeah, it is the same thing. Um, It's just what the Germans happen to call it. You know, this happens a lot throughout the war. There are a lot of offensives that get called battles, like the Battle of Verdun. Um, And, you know, we have a lot of different countries and a lot of different combatants. And so things get called different names and it can be really confusing. But the the 1918 Spring Offensive, the Kaiserslacht, also known as the Ludendorff Offensive, all the same thing. It's a big offensive that stretches over uh, several months and is made up of four or five big main attacks. And this is going to go on for months going forward. Can you give us an overview of what the Germans have in mind? The important thing to remember, Teo, is what they're not trying to do. And they're not trying to capture Paris. Despite all the legend that developed over the years about their 1918 offensive, what they're really trying to do is first and foremost to split the British and French armies. The British are in the north and the north of France and in uh, Flanders and Belgium and the French are to the south. So they're trying to split them, and they're trying to drive the British back toward the Channel ports so that they will evacuate back to England in in an early preview of Dunkirk. And then they expected that they would be able to wipe out the French at their leisure. Uh, And all the subsidiary offenses later on were pretty much bent toward the same objective. This is going to start in March, or is it going to start in uh, April? It's going to start on March 21st. There is the the first Operation Michael, and then there is a subsequent offensive at the beginning of April, uh, and then a few more toward uh, the spring and the summer. The final German offensive takes place along the Marne River on July 15th, and that's where American troops come in of the 3rd Division to play a major role in stopping that last German strike. Catherine, you'd said earlier that there were five major offensives, or was it four? So there's Michael, Georgette, Blucher, York, Nisenau, 
And then the last one, the Marn Schutz Reims Friedenstrom. And of course, again, these all have slightly different <laughs> Try to names. pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, my German's not great. Operation Michael's usually called that, um, and that's the first one that hits on the 21st of March. Georgia is sometimes called the Battle of the Lease. The Blucher York is called the Third Battle of the Ams. Um, and then there's two more after that. Um, but that last one is the second battle of the Marne um, that, that Ed was just, just speaking about. A quick change of subject. Uh, as we get into the military action, we keep throwing around all these names like, you know, military formations like divisions and corps and regiments and brigades. And I'll wager that 80% of the people who listen to the show have no idea what that means. So maybe we can do an overview. I know we sent over a field army, okay? That, that's it. That's the American Expeditionary Forces. So we sent over an army. Ed, can you break it down for us? Well, it's sort of from big to small, and tell us about how many soldiers in each of these formations. Let's keep one principle in mind for all of our listeners. These American formations are really big. They're extremely big. They're about twice the size of their European counterpart. So the American First Army is formed in August of 1918. The basic American unit is the division, and they called these square divisions. Again, they were monstrously large. They were about 28,000 officers and men, plus about 12,000 support personnel. So you're talking 40,000 man divisions. Each division has two brigades, and each brigade has two regiments, uh, including artillery, engineers, machine gun units, and other support troops. Each regiment is roughly about 4,000 officers and men, and each regiment contains three battalions plus a machine gun company. And the battalions have four companies of about 250 officers and men, plus support personnel. So uh, that's the breakdown. But again, these are just huge units. Was that a structure that they rejiggered or reinvented for World War One? We didn't have a giant standing army, so I, I imagine that they sort of had to invent this as they went along. Yeah, this was much of this was Pershing's idea. He thought that by creating these what he called blockbuster divisions that he would be able to build units that would have greater staying power on the western front that they would stay in the line longer that they would be able to grind down enemy divisions and so combat fatigue will become a major problem because of this do we have some kind of a sense of the scale and how it built we're sort of looking at this like a war that's going to go on another three years, not another six months. Um, so we're building up, but that's not necessarily, we don't have the timeline in our minds in 1918 that we would be done within within that calendar year. The Allied forces surpassed the Germans in like rifle strength is one figure that I've seen in late June coming into July that now there's more Allied forces than... German forces on the Western Front. Was that a real tipping point, Ed? By the time you get to spring in May, there are probably about 10 American divisions that are ready to go. And the buildup really escalates after that. More and more of American divisions start arriving in France and in Flanders uh, toward the late spring and early summer of 1918 and tip the balance in terms of rifle strength. But much of that is a result of how many American divisions are there training behind the lines, how many the British and French have been able to move those American divisions up to quiet sectors. And then the British and French can redeploy their own high quality divisions toward the more important sectors of the front. So it, it, it is vastly accelerating by the late spring and early summer of 1918. So, so, Ed, remind us again of how many people approximately in an American division? About 40,000. Catherine, you were talking to me earlier about uh, a book that, uh, that you use as a reference. What is that? Ernst Junger's Storm of Steel, um, which both sort of cover this battle in particular, not just the Kaiserslag, but this first operation in March. And I would say March 21st, I know that the sum looms large in the memory of the British forces in World War One, but March 21st was a really bad day for them. It was 
super foggy and the Germans are so hyped. I think we so often, um, being part of the allied forces as Americans, we forget the German perspective on the war. Ernst Jünger describes them ripping off their coats because they're boiling hot, running through the fog, and they run through the fog past the British lines. And they only realize once they start hitting the artillery lines that they've gone past the British front lines and turn around and start attacking the British from both in front of their lines and behind them. And the British, because of the fog, don't notice this at first. So it's absolute chaos for the British. That's an incredible book, A Storm of Steel. And yeah. I would just add to that, uh, one of the things Junger shows very well is that the Germans had developed these infiltration or stormtroop tactics that they used to break into the gaps in the British lines and surround them and cut off troops at the front. It was very effective. Uh, Pershing needs to integrate with the French and the British command. How does all that lay out? And, and, and how do we see that uh, evolving over the next month and couple of months? President Woodrow Wilson and his Secretary of War, Newton Baker, have been telling Pershing for some time that his objective is to create independent American armies on the Western Front under solely American command. And Pershing has been carrying out that task very effectively. He's an exceptionally stubborn man when the British and French try to get him to agree to, to amalgamation into their units. He simply refuses to agree. Let, let me insert that. The, and the reason that was so important to Baker and Wilson is because they were setting up for their seat at Versailles. That's quite true. And Pershing has that in mind as well. One of Pershing's qualities is he was a very good political general. The French and British have become so desperate that Pershing has no choice but to accept compromise and to agree to begin sending American units to the front under French and British command. So you will find American units through the spring and summer integrated into French and British units, but not amalgamated. So they're not putting on French and British uniforms, but they are fighting under French and British officers. This is a way to get them to the front more quickly than they otherwise would have done and to give them an opportunity to learn. And Catherine, are there any other major stories that you're aware of that we should get ready for this coming month? Yeah, you know, the first recorded cases of the flu come out of Kansas in mid-March. Um, at least that's when a doctor in Kansas City um, at one of the military hospitals sort of goes, this is not a normal flu, this is a really bad one, and he starts getting kind of nervous about it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the start of something that's going to kill more men than the war did. And that's our preview for what's coming up. Next week, we'll be back to our regular 100 Years Ago This Week format, including our regular feature, America Emerges, Military Stories from World War I. Now on to The Great War Project with Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for The Great War Project blog. Mike's recent posts have told us about the devastating suffering of the German people in the fatherland. But the Kaiser and his generals are feeling pretty hot and empowered by the total defeat of the Russians on the Eastern Front. They think they're going to win this thing. The spoils of war from that campaign include vast territorial gains, massive stashes of captured arms, repatriation of huge numbers of soldiers, all now available to put the big wallop on the French and the Brits. Hopefully before the Americans can really join in the fight. So Mike... The details of the Russian collapse are really monumental, aren't they? Uh, extremely monumental, Teo. Our headline reads, German attack in West is imminent. On Russian front, their eyes set on Petrograd. The Kaiser celebrated with champagne. And this is special to the Great War Project. It's a crucial moment in the war for all sides. The peace treaty that ended the war between Germany and Russia fundamentally redrew the map of Europe. The Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, reports historian Martin Gilbert, gave up all claims to the Baltic provinces, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, Poland, Belarusia, Finland, Bessarabia, which is now Moldova, Ukraine, and the Caucasus. Then, a century ago, the Germans looked set to enter Petrograd, the Russian capital. In their rapid and virtually unopposed advance, reports Gilbert, 
The Germans had captured 63,000 Russian prisoners, 2,600 artillery pieces, and 5,000 machine guns. The weapons would be of great value to the Russians on the Western Front. Finally, Russia signs a formal peace treaty with Germany. The Bolsheviks accept the harsh reality of the battlefield that they could no longer resist. The German high command was relieved, Gilbert writes. They were eager to turn Germany's military might against the Western Front. There's much talk now of an imminent German offensive on the Western Front. The Germans think they can finish this war before the waves of American soldiers hit the battlefield. Now, Russia as an empire, indeed Russia as a nation, may not have a future. According to historian Gilbert, the territory Russia had been forced to give up constitutes a third of its pre-war population, a third of its arable land, and nine-tenths of its coal fields. Almost all the territory, in fact, Gilbert observes, that had been added to the Tsarist dominions since the reign of Peter the Great more than 200 years earlier. Nearly all of Russia's naval bases are turned over to the Germans. The Russians lose their naval bases in the Black Sea and in the Baltic Sea, writes Gilbert, the Kaiser celebrated with champagne. The Russians are to release 630,000 Austrian prisoners of war that they hold. One other development that will echo down through the years, Russia agrees to turn the Armenian territories it conquered earlier in the war to Turkey, now the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. Many Turkish soldiers are deserting, effectively taking the Turks out of the war. Lenin surveys Russia's circumstances, fearing that the Germans will seize Petrograd, the Bolsheviks hold an urgent meeting of their leadership and decide to move their capital city to Moscow. Soon the Germans will occupy Odessa in Ukrainian territory on the Black Sea. As historian Gilbert observes, for the first time in history, one power's control of Europe stretched from the North Sea to the Black Sea, something even Napoleon had not achieved. The German triumph in the East was unprecedented and complete. And now the Germans turn to preparations for a massive offensive, one that will destroy the British and French armies before the Americans get to the Western Front in large enough numbers to make a difference. And that's some of the news from the Great War Project this week, 100 years ago. Mike Schuster from the Great War Project blog. The Great War Channel on YouTube is hosted by Indy Nidell. Here's Indy. Hello, World War I Centennial News listeners. I'm Indy Nidell, host of the Great War YouTube channel. American troops are about to experience their first major battle of the war, the Kaiserschlacht. Join us every Thursday for a new episode and follow this massive German offensive as it unfolds. Find us on YouTube and like us on Facebook. This week's new videos from the Great War channel include Operation Faustschlag, Germany advances in the East again, and Amphibious Landing Craft, and the Czechoslovak Legion's Odyssey through Russia. To see their videos, search for The Great War on YouTube or follow the link in the podcast notes. Okay, it's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. In this section, we explore what's happening now to commemorate the centennial of the war that changed the world. We've got a lot to unpack here, so let's get going with medicine in World War I. We have three guests with us today who not only know a whole lot about the subject, but they've also bundled that know-how into an amazing new website on the Commission server at www.cc.org slash medicine, all lowercase. Charles Van Way. A retired Army colonel, professor emeritus at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. George Thompson, adjunct associate professor in the Department of the History and Philosophy of Medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And Sanders Marble, the senior historian with the Army Medical Department Center of History and Heritage. These are the three gentlemen responsible for the website, and they did an amazing job. It may be one of the most authoritative, in-depth, well-illustrated, and concise subject sections on the whole site. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Gentlemen, at the very top of your website, you put a statement. It reads, a century ago, American medicine went to war. I love that. It's really illustrative. Now, how did the three of you get together to do this? The three of us knew each other through working together at the National World War I Museum in Kansas City on some prior projects dealing with military medicine. 
And so we just clicked right from the beginning and we realized that we could communicate well with each other. And so our first step was to say, is this an important topic? And the answer was, of course, yes. How do we get at it? And so we used all of our skills uh, and our prior experience with each other to formulate a syllabus that permitted us to then detail it out and develop it. Charles, let me give you this one. What do you think was the biggest impact of the war on American medicine? Tell you, that's a very good question. And the fact is that medicine had been going through a lot of changes in the previous few years. Medical education had gotten better. Medical care had gotten better. There were a huge number of medical advances. And the war required that these advances be implemented, moved overseas, and applied to a mass casualty healthcare system on the battlefield. I think the organizational impact may have been the single biggest impact, but when you get down to it, the reason that World War I is associated with so many medical advances is the necessity of the situation. They simply had to make a generation's worth of progress in a few months. Okay, a roundtable question. What do you think was the most important innovation in medicine coming out of this war? Let's start with you, Sanders. Sure. First, I need to say that my comments here are not the views of the Department of Defense. I would unpack medicine to into three facets. I, I think there was a tremendous advance in surgery during the war. They do surgery much further forward, closer to the, the fighting front and closer in time to the time of wounding. Surgery saw tremendous advances, areas that were really uncommon, like plastic surgery. We think about the mutilated men from the war, uh, tremendous advances there. Psychiatry uh, comes on people's radar, and they're aware of it, but not sure what to do about it, not sure if it's really a thing. Uh, and even the doctors are bickering about it to a degree. And that's going to take several generations to, to come to much uh, progress. George? I'm going to say orthopedic surgery. Since they had such a massive number of cases and the specialization that evolved, and that uh, carried right on into um, modern times. And Charles? The surgical treatment of wounds. Trench warfare virtually guaranteed that all wounds would be dirty, contaminated. And since two-thirds of the wounds were from artillery, the wounds were very messy, if I can use a non-medical term. The fact that they were able to treat these wounds far forward, as well as treat them adequately, was a tremendous advance. The mortality of soldiers, once they had reached medical care, was far lower in this war than it ever had been before. Okay, we just had a question come in from a member of our live audience through the chat room. They asked, when influenza cases started to appear on the in-transit troop ships, what kind of isolation units were set up on these overcrowded transports to lower the contagion rate? The fact is that many of those ships were not able to isolate the uh, flu victims. And there were a couple of death ships where a quarter or more of the people who fell ill died. These ships, as you point out, were very crowded. We discussed that uh, in the diseases category, but we just gave it a once over lightly compared to the real magnitude of this. In point of fact, about half of the 50,000 or so soldiers who died of disease actually died of influenza or the pneumonia that followed it. Let me turn to the website. I mean, it's a very, very comprehensive work. You could literally do a semester course with it. Let me ask you, Charles, what will I find if I go there? Sure, Tio. You know, getting the incredible amount of documentation down to just the website was, I, th I think, our biggest challenge. The way we decided to do it was to break it up into uh, eight separate topics. We had an introduction, and then we talked about the common diseases in World War I, which are not the diseases we see today, and the common injuries in World War I, which included such exotic things as gas injuries. And then we divided medical care into the things that were done on the battlefield in what we would now call the combat zone. And 
delivery of medical care off the battlefield in what we would now call the rear area. We put a section on practice of medicine in World War I, which included some historical elements as well as a discussion of how mobilization was carried out uh, just to get the Army Medical Department big enough to be able to take care of all of these, uh, all of these folks. And finally, we had a chapter on further study of medicine in which we talked about our sources and pointed people to further resources that they could use to explore particular topics. Hey, thanks to all three of you for coming in and introducing us to the subject of medicine in World War I. But, but most of all, thank you for the huge effort, the months-long effort that you put into building this scholarly, in-depth, well-thought-through website. Certainly, Theo. Thank you very much. Charles Van Way, George Thompson, and Sanders Marble are the curators of Medicine in World War I, the amazing new resource at www.cc.org slash medicine. Or follow the link in the podcast notes. To kick off our Remembering Veterans section this week, let's talk about VSOs. That stands for Veteran Service Organizations. Organizations like the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, or VFW, the Daughters of the American Revolution, or DAR, and a whole lot of others. These organizations are very important partners for the Commission, with closely aligned goals and missions. Many of you listening today are in fact members of a VSO, but if you're not, let me give you an overview of who they are. First of all, they're amazing, and amazingly dedicated organizations focused on the men and the women who served and sacrificed for our nation. And although they have national organizations, for the most part, they're very grassroots by nature, with thousands of local posts and chapters all around the country that do the real hands-on stuff. BSOs have been deeply involved in many of our commemorative programs, including 100 cities, 100 memorials, centennial commemorations with states, and they've been key financial contributors to the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. But as I said, it's all about the local level. So for the local posts and the chapters, we've just published a special new landing page on our website just for them. The landing page is a series of subject and activity tiles that make it easy to see how to get involved with the centennial commemoration of the war that changed the world. It's actually not a bad resource for anybody at www.cc.org slash veteran, all lowercase. And of course, you can always find it by following the link in the podcast notes. Staying with veterans, wrapping up African American History Month, and leading us into Women's History Month, this segment is about the experience of African American nurses in World War I. Joining us again is Dr. Marjorie DeRozier, who was on a few weeks ago. Dr. DeRozier is an international nurse historian and independent scholar. She herself is also a registered nurse and former clinical professor from the University of Washington School of Nursing in Seattle. Welcome back, Dr. DeRozier. Thank you, Sam. Dr. DeRozier, the story of African American nurses in World War I is pretty fascinating. But to start with, could you tell us about how an African American woman would go about becoming a nurse in that era? There was an advent of uh, hospital training standards of a two, two to three year curriculum now that led to a diploma or certificate in nursing. So in increasing their profile in America, African-American women entered into nurses training with extreme disadvantages of racial segregation across American society. Most of the established hospital training schools had refused to accept black women. Many actually believed that they were incapable of of succeeding in professional training. The programs, because they were residential, were leading to issues of segregated housing and living quarters, and there were also restrictions against Black nurses in training caring for white patients. The Black communities responded to this by opening their own separate hospitals and training schools. But these were also very, very few in number, and once nurses were trained, there were other racial exclusions that they encountered after graduation. One, in some states, was the outright denial of the right to gain RN licensure. They were barred from membership in the very powerful ranks of the American Nurses Association. They were unable to obtain postgraduate training in public health nursing. And they were also up against lower wage structures in the United States. How did these women respond to this? How did they overcome this? The American Red Cross was 
the organization that was responsible for enrolling nurses in time of war for the U.S. Army. And it was not known at that time that segregation in the Army was going to be the policy placed by the War Department. So in 1916, even before the the war was declared, there was not a sense that African-American nurses would be excluded from enrolling in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps through the Red Cross enrollment mechanism. As a matter of fact, one of the the lesser-known stories is that one of the major black hospitals in America, Lincoln Hospital in New York, had actually set up in 1916 plans for becoming one of the 50 U.S. Army Red Cross authorized base hospitals that would be going to France in the event of war. So in order to become a base hospital, nurses would need to be enrolled in the Red Cross and enrolled in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. But it began to emerge in 1917 that with the segregation of black and white troops instituted as policy, that black nurses were going to be excluded from enrolling in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps simply because the Secretary of War and the Surgeon General had announced that it would be a problem of segregated housing. These nurses would not be able to expect to serve in camp hospitals in the United States or to go to France. Was there a resolution to that? The activities that occurred then in 1918 were intensified by the Surgeon General's announcement of an extreme nurse shortage in the Army Nurse Corps. Um, He was calling for an additional thousand nurses to be recruited nationally per week for induction. And yet black nurses had been sidelined and fold in an equivocal fashion. Nurses, black nurses could put themselves on a membership list but they may not be called because, again, of the issue of segregated housing. This was infuriating to the black community. These um, nurses were basically being prohibited from the exercise of their rights and duties of citizenship while their own African-American men were serving in the military. So there was a, a protest was mounted through the offices of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, which was representing black nurses in America. The NAACP was involved in protests, and the news media throughout the United States became inflamed about um, this restriction. Nothing changed, and it was not until December 1918, after the armistice was signed, and when the influenza pandemic was creating even more pressure for nurses, that 18 African-American women were enrolled in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. And they were allowed to serve in Illinois at Camp Grant and in Ohio at Camp Sherman. Dr. DeRosa, where can people learn more about this? This information can be located quite easily, internet sites. Okay, we've posted some of those links in the podcast notes for our listeners. Dr. DeRosa, thank you for coming back on the show to bring us the story. Yes, thank you. Dr. DeRosier is an international nurse historian, independent scholar, and registered nurse. Follow the link in the podcast notes to learn more about African-American nurses in World War I and Dr. DeRosier's work. Moving on to our 100 Cities, 100 Memorial segment about the $200,000 matching grant challenge to rescue and focus on our local World War I memorials. This is a perfect tie-in to the VSO story we just told you about because this project's being done by the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 968 in Raymond, Washington. With us to tell us about their city and the project is Gordon Aylshire, adjutant of VFW Post 968. Gordon, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. Gordon, you live in a beautiful and pretty remote part of the country. Tell us about Raymond, Pacific County, and the area's role in World War I. Well, Raymond is a city of about 6,000 now, uh, primarily uh, logging and fishing. And the um, post uh, was first started in uh, 1922, shortly after uh, World War I. And um, they dedicated uh, this uh, first memorial in November of that 1940. And over the years, it sort of fell into disrepair. And when this 100 Cities uh, project came alive, it caused us to take a look at the memorial and the condition it had fallen into and 
uh, it was the uh, initiative to get us going to bring it back to life. So it sounds like the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program is what got your project going. Yes, it was. It was really kind of brought it to our attention. And it was an opportunity to not only restore it, but to move it five blocks across town to where we had another memorial listing all of the fallen veterans in Pacific County through all the wars and put them in the same park setting. How did you hear about the program? I think it was from a national email from uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars uh, uh, office. That's terrific. So I see uh, you're you're doing a lot of things to restore the memorial. Tell us a little bit about the memorial itself and what you're doing for it. Well, it was a concrete column, uh, about seven feet tall, and we had to have it re-stuccoed. Then we had to um, pick it up and physically move it across town. There were three rifles that were on top of it that had fallen into disrepair over the years. They actually had wood stocks and they just deteriorated. So we had Valley Bronze Work out of uh, Joseph, Oregon, cast a bronze sculpture of three rifles that has now been placed on top of the old base to bring back the appearance of what it was when it was first dedicated. Do you have any rededication plans for the memorial? We do. We're looking at uh, May 19th, uh, Armed Forces Day, to try to get some community leaders and other uh, groups to participate and uh, rededicate it, uh, hoping by then to have the plaque that I believe is coming from you folks to go on it at the same time. Gordon, it's a, it's a wonderful project, and uh, you live in a beautiful place. Thank you, and thank everybody from Post 968 for the great work that you're doing remembering our Doughboys. Well, thank you very much for all your work, too. This is a, a great collaboration. Gordon Aylshire is the adjutant of VFW Post 968 in beautiful Raymond, Washington. As we mentioned, March is Women's History Month. So this week for our Spotlight in the Media, we're joined by Eliza Chen, Carrie Kukrell, and Molly Marr. They're the team that researched and produced the documentary called At Home and Over There, American Women Physicians in World War I. Eliza, you're the executive director of the American Medical Women's Association. Briefly, what is it? What's the organization represent? The American Medical Women's Association is an organization that was founded in 1915. Uh, We've been around for over 100 years. Um, We encompass women in medicine from all different specialties, and our mission is twofold, to advance women in medicine and to improve women's health. There were not many women physicians uh, when the organization was formed, right? Right. There were less than 6% um, of all physicians in the country at that time. Okay, Carrie, you're the founder and CEO of Raw Science TV. Again, briefly, what is that? Raw Science TV is a, an online network and a video on demand platform for science media specifically. Thank you. And Molly, you're the executive chair of the American Medical Women's Association branch at a university. How's that work? So the American Medical Women's Association has uh, branches all over the country, and they are at both undergraduate institutions and graduate institutions. So I have a branch in the School of Medicine, and it's a wonderful way of connecting young women who are pursuing the field of medicine, the study of medicine, or women who are currently in medical school with mentors and physician leaders and scientists that can really guide and direct them on their path. All right, so the three of you came together to create this wonderful documentary, and I have to add, a really impressive companion online web exhibit. How do you all get together on this? Eliza, can you tell us? Absolutely. So we had heard about the activities um, around the country commemorating the centennial of World War I, and of course, as part of our history in the American Medical Women's Association was the fact that we helped Uh, sent a group uh, abroad and got very involved with getting women registered to help, um, mostly in a volunteer capacity with the war effort, um, both abroad and at home. So when we heard the news about the activities surrounding World War I, we wanted to tell the story about women physicians, which is a very little-known story. There are some chapters published, uh, books, a few books and articles about it, but the public at large, most people don't know about the women doctors. So this started the work for our exhibition. And as we created the exhibition, we realized there were so many wonderful stories, uh, photographs, documents 
that we wanted to share in a more public way. And coincidentally, our interim leadership meeting was going to be in Kansas. And the National World War I Museum and Memorial, of course, is there. So we decided to put together some of our materials into a film. I happened to meet Carrie Kukro. We got talking. Um, she was very excited to participate. And uh, that's what started the collaboration. between. Okay, Carrie, the film has a 3D component to it. Tell us about that. What was the intent of doing 3D? Well, the intent of doing that was to really kind of be able to better bring this the history to life in an almost animated 3D way where people, uh, the women in World War I, kind of almost come out of the screen to us and, and come to life. And this was inspired by a great uh, work that was done on a documentary film with the uh, bringing the Cultural Revolution in China to life in a similar way. So um, that's why we chose to do that. Molly, you did a lot of the research. Anything particular surprise you? I did a lot of the research in the Oregon Health and Science University archives and looking through artifacts, letters, and materials from that time from women physicians in Oregon specifically. What really struck me the entire time was this ongoing fight for women's suffrage. I think you know, someone today who's been voting since I was 18, I really took that for granted. And I'd never considered that ongoing interaction between women's suffrage, the women's suffrage movement and the war effort. My favorite story that came out of that is that um, citizenship was one of many ways the military really restricted potential recruits. And so there was a group of women in Oregon who were like, oh, we can take care of this. And so they really looked through the restrictions carefully all of the different um, war department regulations, and there was nothing there that explicitly barred women. And so they looked up every single requirement. They made sure they met every single requirement, letter for letter, and they showed up at one of the recruitment drives and said, we're here. We have our license. We have our references. We have our certificates. We have our diplomas. We have everything that you require so that we can volunteer. And we're ready. We're ready to, to start basic training. As I recall, the Surgeon General had no option but to accept that, right? He, no, they denied it. Ah. They still denied entry, in fact. Um, and there were actually, so that's interesting, because they did petition to the Surgeon General. There were multiple petitions. There was a resolution that came out of California. People, women really fought this because they wanted to contribute. And in every instance, their desires were overturned, and they were, they were prevented from enlisting. Okay, Eliza. If somebody wanted to book the film for a local screening or World War I event, how, how would they do that? So we're happy to share the film with anybody who would like to screen it. And so we have a link on our website to contact us. And we're happy to give you a copy of the film to screen. We would really like the story to be shared. Well, we're going to put that link in the podcast notes as well. Thank you all for joining us today and telling us the story. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So Eliza Chin is the executive director of the American Medical Women's Association. Carrie Kukrell is the CEO of Raw Science TV, and Molly Marr is an MD-PhD student at Oregon Health and Science University. You can learn more about their project, At Home and Over There, American Women Physicians in World War I, and how to access the documentary for your World War I events by following the link in the podcast notes. And now our feature, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. During World War I, as planes flew over the front, little puffs of smoke appeared in the sky. Well, actually, each one of those puffs was a deadly expanding ball of shrapnel designed to mangle planes and pilots. So true to British humor, this deadly deterrent for flyers got a silly nickname, which is our Speaking World War I word for this week. Archie was the British nickname for anti-aircraft fire, and it has two contested origins. Origin number one, a pilot in the Royal Air Force, Vice Marshal Borton, who, upon encountering enemy anti-aircraft fire, apparently quoted a lyric from a popular music hall song of the time, Archibald certainly not, a popular contemporary cultural exclamation of defiance. Archibald certainly not. About this cricket game I've read a lot. Besides, last time you played at Dover, I heard you bowled a maiden over. Ask me both. Certainly not. Origin number two. The training ground for the RAF pilots back in England at Brooklands in Surrey neighbored a sewage farm, the Archibald Sewage Farm. Apparently, 
The farm, which processed sewage to irrigate and fertilize the land, had notoriously difficult air currents above it, creating a wafting turbulence the pilots found quite similar to that of anti-aircraft fire. Either way, Archie, a humorous and very English term for the explosives that trailed and tormented the pilots as they flew over the front in World War I. See the podcast notes to learn more. For World War I War Tech this week, we're taking a look at the Browning machine gun. It got a lot of press this week 100 years ago because apparently on February 27, 1918, in the vicinity of Congress Heights in southeastern Washington, D.C., it sounded like the war in Europe had suddenly spread to America. This is because they were test firing the new Browning at the U.S. government's shooting range. The gun, the Browning Automatic Rifle, BAR, and the Browning M1917 were being demonstrated to a crowd of American politicians, foreign army officers, and the press. The firearms were being touted as the finest gun in the world. The machine guns were the brainchild of John Moses Browning, a man also known as the father of modern firearms, whose weapon designs included the pump-action shotgun. When the Army sent out a request to all American inventors asking for new firearm designs in 1917, Browning personally traveled to the Capitol to present his new prototypes. The Ordnance Department demanded that these weapons be put to the test by shooting 20,000 rounds of ammunition. When the test was performed at the government proving grounds in May of 1917, Browning's gun fired the 20,000 required rounds with no complications, then fired another 20,000 rounds, only breaking a single part. Besides reliability, another impressive feature was a design so simplistic that the officers who demonstrated the weapon could take it apart and put it back together while blindfolded. This made such an impression on the War Department that the blindfold test soon became an essential part of military training. Mass production began soon thereafter, with the first Browning guns arriving in France in June of 1918. Although only 1,168 Brownings saw combat, the general design proved so useful that the Browning M1917 was an essential part of the American arsenal all the way until the Korean War. Read more about the Browning at the link in the podcast notes. This week for the Wright blog, which explores World War I's influence on contemporary writing and scholarship, the post reads, Brest Litovsk, Eastern Europe's Forgotten Father. The post was written by Adrian Bonenberger. In his lifetime, the world-famous Polish dancer Vaslav Nijinsky might have also claimed Russian, German, or Ukrainian nationalities. The future of Nijinsky's Europe and his identity was decided on March 3, 1918. Veteran author Adrian Bonenberger calls the event the moment when the old world falls apart and creates space for the new to arise. In this week's Right Post, Bonenberger gives us a rich overview of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty and its implications for the former Soviet bloc countries. Read the story at www.cc.org slash wwrite or follow the link in the podcast notes. Changing formats a little, Catherine Akey is going to close out this week with a story about an article we posted on our website at www.cc.org news about an American painter and ambulance driver, Waldo Pierce. But her story is equally about Corinne Rice, the author of the article and a dedicated French curator of World War I stories and images. Catherine, you're the one who came across Corrine that led to the article. Maybe we should start with her. Her curated images are truly amazing. Hey, Teo. Yeah, the, the project Corrine's been working on is something else. Uh, published on our website and included in our weekly email dispatch is an interview with Corinne. She's a French citizen historian and the great niece of American painter and ambulance driver Waldo Pierce. He was one of the many students voluntarily leaving their lives at home, for him his studies at Harvard, to aid the French years before America joined the war. Corinne meticulously and with a great sense of storytelling curates and shares his photographs, artwork, and writings on her Tumblr and Facebook pages, chronicling his experience throughout the war. In the interview, Corinne discusses her passion, the incredible archive left behind by her great uncle Waldo, and her plans for documenting the lives of volunteers during World War II as well. 
Additionally to reading the interview, I'd really, really encourage you to take time to scroll through her Tumblr, which can be found embedded in the interview at worldwar1cc.org. To say that Corinne is a dedicated storyteller is an understatement of the highest order. I first came across her Tumblr during my weekly search for photographic content for the commission and was really surprised at how few of the images were familiar to me. So much of what she has rediscovered and shared with the world is quiet, quotidian, and somehow spectacular. An image of a woman ambulance driver holding a kitten and casually wearing the croix de guerre. An over-the-shoulder shot of a young British officer staring longingly at the photo of a woman tucked inside his hat, or an image of a man sitting in the midst of a dense, unspoiled French forest as sunbeams glance through the trees, and a crowd gathering around a deep, shearing hole in the Parisian street, the result of a recent German air raid. The collection Corinne has assembled and continues to assemble is exceptional. The hours of work, as well as her very artful eye and deep passion for the subject, are evident in every post. We've included links in the podcast notes to the interview with Did With Her, as well as to her Facebook and Tumblr pages. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of World War I Centennial News. We also want to thank our guests, Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author, Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Charles Van Way, George Thompson, and Sanders Marble, the curators of the new Medicine in World War I website. Dr. Marjorie DeRosier, nurse, author, and historian. Gordon Aylshire, adjutant of VFW Post 968. Eliza Chin, Carrie Kukrell, and Molly Marr, the production team behind the documentary At Home and Over There, American Women Physicians in World War I. Catherine Akey, the commission's social media director and the line producer for the podcast. Thank you also to our intern, John Morellis, for his great research assistance. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I. And this podcast, and you're listening to it, is a part of that. Thank you. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's national World War I memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast can be found on our website at ww1cc.org slash cn on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Podbean, and new this week on Stitcher, Radio On Demand, as well as other places you get your podcasts, even on your smart speaker. Just say, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. Our Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. It's for your land and my land and the fame of old Lang Dine. Just like Washington crossed the Delaware, General Perkins will cross the Rhine. Archie, Veronica and Jughead, three types of deadly munitions from World War I. (laughs) Not true. Just kidding. So long.